Thank you, Mary. Here you go. Let me bring up your presentation then. There you go. And you just hit page down and that will change. All right. Thanks, Liz. Good afternoon. Welcome to our broadcast of the new FLSA overtime rules. My name is Mary Hunter and I'm an HR and Compensation Director with MRA. Today's session is scheduled to last one hour. We're going to be taking questions, but as Liz said, we'd like you to hold those until the end of the session. And you will be able to use the chat feature at that time. I'm excited to bring this important information to you and to help you prepare as you work to comply with the new regulations. Let me give you a very brief introduction to MRA, who we are and what we do. We help business thrive by creating powerful teams and safe, successful workplaces. We've been around over 110 years. Today we serve over 4,000 employers, covering 800,000 employees. Some of our key services include our InfoNow line, which is available 24-7 an online resource center, survey data for pay, benefits, and workforce trends, complimentary webinars such as the one you are viewing, and a variety of groups that bring our members together to share expertise. You can learn more at our website, www.mranet.org, or by calling our 800 number, 488-4845. Today we will discuss a brief history and purpose of the FLSA or the Fair Labor Standards Act. We will also provide a comparison of final regulations to the current requirements, would we'll give you information about the effective date, and speak to what this new rule means to you. We will also give you some steps that you as employers can take, what we call our practical advice. So let's start by discussing what the FLSA covers. It covers areas such as minimum wage, overtime pay, youth employment standards, and record keeping. For today's webcast, we're really going to be focusing on the area of overtime pay. The FLSA applies to virtually every organization. In addition, states have laws that address overtime pay, which may or may not be identical to federal law. Employees are entitled to the most favorable benefit of the federal or state law. When you are assessing the exemption of a position, you need to look not only at the federal FLSA, but also your state FLSA, where the position is located, and any applicable federal and state court cases. Let's start with some exempt status basics. Okay. And let's talk about the difference between exempt and non-exempt. In taxes, you can claim exempt from taxes. Similarly, in FLSA language, exempt means the position the person is in is exempt from the overtime requirements of the FLSA or not eligible for overtime pay. Non-exempt positions fall under the requirements of the FLSA and employees in these positions are eligible for overtime. As noted on this slide, hourly or salaried is how an employee is paid. The terms exempt and non-exempt are often used synonymously with salaried and hourly. It's really not correct to say that a salaried person is exempt, although it may be true, but not always. Likewise, not all hourly paid employees are non-exempt. So what does it take for a position to be exempt from overtime? The FLSA has three very important criteria. They are, first, the salary basis, meaning the employee in a position must be paid on a salaried basis for the position to be exempt from overtime. There are a few exceptions, like doctors, but generally for the most commonly used exemptions, 
we will discuss paying on a salaried basis as a criteria. Along with the salary must be at least a certain minimum amount, which we will discuss in just a little bit. And finally, the position must call for the performance of specific duties. We will go through these duties requirements as well. Let's start by looking at what it means to be paid on a salaried basis. Under FLSA regulations, in order to qualify as an exempt executive, administrative, or professional employee, the employee must be compensated on a salary basis at a rate of not less than the minimum weekly threshold established by the government or the Department of Labor. Currently, this is $455 per week, but it is changing as we will discuss soon. The salary cannot be reduced due to quality or quantity of the employee's work and is generally paid for any week in which the employee performs any work. Let me give you an example. If your office experiences a power outage one day and employees are sent home, your salaried exempt employee's pay will be the same. No time would be deducted for the employee in an exempt position working a shorter day. You may have worked in a company where salaried employees do not have days described as used for sick time. A salaried exempt employee's weekly pay would be the same even if a day or two of work was missed during the week. Here's a comparison of the new minimum salary rules with what they were in 2004 when last updated. So first off, exempt, executive, administrative, professional, or computer employees must currently be compensated on a salary basis at a rate of not less than $455 per week, or $23,660 annually. While this was not initially proposed I guess I'm sorry, while this was proposed initially to change to 970 per week or 50,440 per year, the final regulations set the salary at 913 per week, which is the equivalent of $47,476 per year. These will be updated every three years, the minimum salary threshold. According to the Department of Labor, Every year that the threshold remains unchanged, it covers fewer and fewer workers as wages overall increase over time. The FLSA's final rule fixes this by requiring automatic updates of the salary threshold every three years, beginning January 1, 2020. If you are wondering where that number came from, it is equal to the 40th percentile of full-time salaried workers in the lowest wage census region. That's important because there are no regional differences for the minimum weekly salary amount. Whether you are in California or Nebraska, you are subject to the same number. Let's move down the slide to the computer employee's exemption. Note that currently in lieu of a salary, they can be compensated at an hourly rate of at least $27.63 per hour. This was unchanged in the proposed regulations and remains unchanged. Finally, the highly compensated employees performing office or non-manual work and paid total annual compensation of $100,000 or more which must include at least the $455 per week paid on a salary or fee basis, was a requirement for 2004. While the proposed regulations called for that number to be increased to $122,148 per year, along with the $970 proposed weekly minimum salary, the final regulations came out with a different number, $134,004, which includes the $913 per week minimum. 
Note that the regulations are effective December 1, 2016. This is better than the 60 to 90 days originally proposed. And for many of you on a calendar year budget, it is close to coinciding with the new budget as it is likely you may need to make some budgetary changes with the new regulations. Here is a change which might help in meeting the new salary threshold. As you can see, the Department of Labor got a lot of feedback on whether or not non-discretionary bonuses and incentive payments for non-highly compensated employees could be counted as part of the minimum salary threshold. In the 2004 regulations, this was not allowed. After much input from many people around the entire U.S., the Department of Labor did make the decision to include for the first time non-discretionary bonuses and incentive payments that are paid on at least a quarterly basis as salary for purposes of meeting the minimum threshold. It's pretty restrictive, so keep in mind that only 10% of the salary requirement, or about $4,700 per year, can be made up of non-discretionary bonuses or incentive payments. Note again, it must be paid at least quarterly, and the Department of Labor did allow a catch-up payment at the end of each quarter if the incentive or bonus was lower than needed. It might be that an employee did not meet their objectives or had less sales than expected, causing the payment to be lower. If the salary with the incentive does not meet the minimum threshold in a quarter, the employee will need to be paid overtime during that quarter. A non-discretionary bonus is one that an employee expects to be paid based on past practice, a policy, a written agreement, or a contract. Oops, sorry, let me back up one here. Finally, the highly compensated employees performing office or non-manual work and paid total annual compensation of $100,000 or more, which must include at least $455 per week paid on a salary or fee basis, was a requirement for 2004. Oh. <laughs> All right, it's one of those days. Hold on for a minute while we proceed to the next slide. I want to talk about the primary duty. All of a primary duty, which is considered the principal, main, major, or most important duty that the employee performs, is a specific requirement on the exemptions that we're going to look at. This primary duty must consist of certain duties that make it either executive, administrative, professional, or computer. When we look at the job duties, that's the next consideration, and we must look at what does the employee do. Under the current regulations, the majority of work must be exempt level work. But time alone does not really determine what makes up the majority. The 2015 proposed regulations made no changes to the duties test. The proposed rule did, however, solicit input from stakeholders on if the current definition of the duties test is working as intended to screen out employees who are not bona fide white collar employees. Based on input received from the nearly 300,000 respondents, the Department of Labor made no changes to the duties test on the exemption. They stated that they believe that the increased salary threshold ensures that employees who meet the salary threshold are most likely primarily performing exempt work. For workers with salaries above the updated salary level, employers will continue to use the same duties test to determine whether or not the worker is entitled to overtime pay. Let's 
next touch on the types of organizations that will most likely be affected by these changes. The FLSA exemption rules are also called the white collar exemptions. However, under the FLSA, there are certain white collared salaried workers who are not subject to the salary level test. These workers include teachers, academic administrative personnel, physicians, lawyers, judges, and outside sales workers. According to the Department of Labor, about one in five exempt jobs are affected by the new salary requirements. The types of positions most likely to be affected are lower salaried supervisors in industries such as retail, restaurants, services, healthcare, and nonprofits. In addition, the Department of Labor issued specific suggestions for nonprofit organizations that are subject to the new requirements as they are likely to hit this group most deeply. You can actually find those suggestions on the Department of Labor website. If you have employees who make less than $913 a week and are currently classified as exempt, you are affected by the new rule and you do need to take action now so that you will be in compliance as of the effective date. The new rule will not affect teachers, academic administrative personnel, physicians, lawyers, judges, and outside sales workers. So what should you as an employer do? Here we're going to walk through four steps that MRA recommends you take at this time and discuss each. First, we suggest that you review and update your current job descriptions. You want to make sure that they represent what your employees are currently doing so that you will be accurate when you're applying the exemption test. Then we suggest that you review those classifications and ensure they're consistent with the FLSA requirements. Next, you'll want to identify jobs that are currently classified as exempt that will be impacted by the new rule. As a reminder, those would be jobs that are paid a salary between $23,660 and $47,476. Currently, those jobs are exempt on a salaried basis, but they will not be when the new regulations go into effect December 1st. Finally, you need to look at how your changes will be implemented. The next step would be to review positions currently classified as exempt to ensure they are properly classified in accordance with what the new rules require as of December 1st. We will briefly discuss each of the exemptions and identify some quick steps you can take to do a preliminary assessment of the application of an exemption. I've included a handout that will help you walk through determining exemption status under the FLSA. You can access this by going to the handout section of your control panel and clicking on the link to access it. I'll give you just a few seconds to do that. All right, so let's walk through these exemptions. First, we're going to start with the executive professional computer and outside sales jobs. We're going to leave administrative exemption for last because that is the most difficult one to evaluate. If you determine that the position meets one or more of the other exemptions, 
you don't have to evaluate the applicability of the administrative exemption. Also, when you realize, or sorry, when you evaluate the professional exemption, we suggest that you limit your assessment to the learned professional exemption, as the creative professional exemption involves the performance of work requiring invention, imagination, originality, or talent in a recognized field of artistic or creative endeavor. Examples of positions that meet the creative professional exemption are actors, musicians, composers, soloists, certain painters, writers, cartoonists, essayists, and novelists. Since most organizations don't employ these types of workers, you should focus on the learned professional exemption and evaluate the creative professional exemption only if no other exemption applies and it appears the individual is a musician, painter, writer, or any of the other ones we named. Most ordinary writers do not typically include those who draft general workplace communications. So we're really talking about writers who would you know, be doing original and creative pieces of work. Here are MRA's quick tips for assessing the applicability of the executive exemption. If the employee does not supervise two or more full-time employees, the employee does not meet the executive exemption. And we do talk here in terms of FTE. So if you had a part-time employee who was working just half-time, you would need two of those to equal one full-time equivalent employee as counted in this particular exemption. So what should you assess? The specific management duties the employee performs. If the employee does not supervise two or more full-time employees, the employee does not meet the executive exemption. It's expected that management is the primary duty of a, an employee who meets the executive exemption. If the employee supervises two or more employees but does not manage a department or department unit or subdivision, the employee does not meet the executive exemption. So how to assess is to review the organizations and or the department's organizational chart. It can also be helpful talking to the supervisor about what duties are involved. Here's MRA's quick tip for assessing the applicability of the learned professional exemption. Unless the job requires that the employee have a minimum of a bachelor's degree in a field related to work that the employee will perform, the employee will not meet the learned professional exemption. Here's what you should look for. The degree requirement on the job. If an employee may be promoted into the position without a four-year degree, or the degree may be in any number of fields, for example, business or liberal arts or fine arts, the learned professional exemption will not apply. This exemption includes positions like engineers and RNs as learned professionals. The how to assess is to review the minimum educational qualifications of the job. Here's our quick tips for assessing the applicability of the computer jobs exemption. The employee must be in a computer systems analyst, a programmer, software engineer, or other similarly skilled worker in the computer field. What should you look at? We'll look at their job duties. If an employee is doing manufacturer or repair of computer hardware and related equipment, that's a manual position and it would not qualify for the exemption. Also, help desk employees do not qualify, nor do drafters or others skilled in CAD computer-aided design software. 
review the essential functions of the job to assess this exemption. Next, we'll move on to assessing the outside sales exemption. Here's our quick assessment tip. The employee must be regularly away from the employer's place of business, which includes the employee's home if the employee works from home. So what are you going to look at? The frequency of visiting customers. Employees must visit customers at the facility on more than an occasional, but less than a constant basis. Outside sales does not include sales made by mail, telephone, or the internet, unless this contact is done in connection with sales made by the personal contact. Finally, drivers who sell qualify for the outside sales exemption only if their primary duty is the sale of the employer's products rather than driving. How do you assess this? You evaluate the percentage of time that the salesperson is in your office. I like to consider if the salesperson has an office or do they actually sit at a workstation. If the salesperson has his or her own assigned office at your organization and they're in it frequently, it's very possible that they are not regularly away from your office making sales by personal contact. If the salesperson is not regularly away from your office making sales by personal contact, then the outside sales exemption does not apply. I want to note here that in Wisconsin, you also must be at out calling on customers at least 80% of the time, which is really higher than the expectation under the federal requirements. Where we, and recall that we have, when you are covered by both, you need to comply with the one more generous to the employee. Last, I'd like to look at the administrative exemption, which as I mentioned is often the very toughest to assess. Here's our quick assessment tools. To assess the applicability of the administrative exemption, all of the questions on this slide should be answered yes. The position must be an office job that is performed in every organization, for example, marketing, HR, legal, or accounting. There would be significant consequences to the organization, not simply to the department, if the work were not performed. The employee has the authority to negotiate and bind the company on significant financial matters. The work is important and key to the organization's success. What should you assess? Review the employee's decision-making authority. If the employee regularly performs work of a repetitive nature, has a low-level spending limit on how much he or she may negotiate on behalf of the company, does not make policy, and may not deviate from policy without prior approval, the employee most likely does not meet the administrative exemption. We recommend that if it's a close call, you classify the employee as non-exempt. Once you have updated any classification assessment of your exempt position, the next steps you should take is to identify all of the jobs that will likely be impacted by the new rule. We suggest you first consider any positions that are currently classified as exempt but which have a salary below $913 per week or $47,476 per year. These are the ones that are you know, most vulnerable to the new regulations. Second, you may wish to assess whether the employee spends more than 50% of his or her time performing exempt level work. Again, if the position is in Wisconsin, the employee is already required to spend more than 80% of his or her time performing exempt work. So you most likely don't need to complete this step. Also remember that for retail operations, because I do believe we have several retail members, 
tuning in today, you're actually allowed to have 40% rather than 20% non-exempt work. For employees currently classified as exempt who have salaries below 913 per week, you have several decisions to make. First, you can raise employees' salaries to the new minimum level and retain their exempt status. The financial impact of increasing salaries to the new required minimum could be significant. For example, an employee currently paid $30,000 meets the salary test, but will need over $17,000 more to meet the new test. That is more than a 50% increase and very costly. You may not, as an organization, be able to afford it. In those situations, you can reclassify them as non-exempt. You will need to calculate a new hourly rate for them and will need to consider the impact of any overtime pay. Certainly in the calculations, if the employee works significant overtime, it may be less expensive to classify the employee as salaried and to raise their salary. The final action MRA recommends is that you determine how changes to employees' classifications will be implemented in your organization. Are you going to do them across the entire company? Will you do them simply by department? Will you do them by functional area? Or will you do them on a case-by-case -case basis? These are individual as each company's operations and culture are different and you need to do what is best aligned with your organization. Plan to put together suggested talking points for discussing the required changes with the various functional areas of your company, including your leadership. Depending on your organization, you may be expected to bring recommendations on how to implement the changes. Considerations include the number of employees in a position that will be reclassified, the number of hours per week on average that the employees have been working, and if the employees in somewhat similar roles are generally classified as exempt or non-exempt employees. As part of this process, it's also important to determine how to communicate to managers and employees. Managers need to know that employees who transition from an exempt to non-exempt status will now be subject to time tracking requirements. All time that the employees spend on work-related activities, whether while during business hours or after hours on weekends, will need to be tracked. For employees, MRA recommends you do the following. When meeting with an employee to discuss a change in their Fair Labor Standards Act status, from exempt to non-exempt, employees often view this change as a loss of workplace status or demotion. They fear that their employer no longer sees them as a professional. They can experience a change in benefits or loss in other incentives as you may have these set up to be different for salaried exempt versus non-exempt employees. They also can view punching a time clock negatively. Cumulatively, this may make for a difficult conversation. Consider these best practices and helpful tips to keep the conversation on track for the best possible outcome. Schedule meetings in advance. Let the employee and his or her manager know the topic you plan to discuss. This allows for mental preparation for the meeting and anticipation of questions that may arise. If possible, provide 30 to 60 day advance notice before the change goes into effect to allow adequate time for personal budget and financial planning if needed. Many times employers will have a payroll that has a different schedule for salaried exempt employees than non-exempt and you'll want to help employees prepare for that. If an entire job class is impacted by a change in exemption status, Consider holding a group meeting to discuss 
with all affected employees at the same time. Offer to meet individually with employees following the group meeting. Prepare an FAQ or memo for employees regarding the FLSA, changes in legislation, if applicable, and how the change will impact them. Inform employees your organization is committed to ensuring they are correctly classified and receive the protection that they are guaranteed under the FLSA. We believe messaging should be direct, yet respectful. Remember the impact on morale and the perception employees have. No matter how difficult the conversation, stay in charge of yourself, your purpose, and your emotions. Let's revisit the timeline for compliance with the new rule. While the regulations were issued on May 17, 2016, employers do not need to be in compliance until December 1, 2016. Therefore, you have a few months to take necessary actions in reviewing and evaluating your jobs. I'd like to conclude by talking about some of the consequences for failing to pay overtime pay under the FLSA. And believe me, there are many. First, there are Department of Labor actions, which may include an investigation, lawsuits for unpaid overtime wages, and an equal amount as liquidated damages. There can be junctions to restrain any person from violating the FLSA. It can also require you as an employer to change your employment practices. Employees may sue for back pay and an equal amount as liquidated damages, plus attorney fees and court costs. Some of the penalty, penalties and sanctions include willful violations of the FMLSA, may be prosecuted criminally, and the employer fined up to $10,000. A second conviction can actually result in imprisonment. If an employer willfully or repeatedly violates overtime pay requirements, they're also subject to a civil money penalty of up to $1,100 per violation. Finally, with regard to the statute of limitations, the Department of Labor will investigate claims going back three years from the date the claim is filed if it's a willful violation of the FLSA, and two years for claims where no such willfulness is apparent. That concludes the formal presentation that I have for you today. At this time, we are going to turn to any questions you may have. When, you know, we'll give you time also to certainly to include those. So we're just pulling up to see if we have some questions. Giving these presentations, while you're thinking about questions you may have, to talk about um, some commonly asked questions. One commonly asked question regards part-time employees. A lot of employers thought that they could prorate that weekly minimum to a part-time employee. So, for example, if your employee is only half-time, you'd only have to do half of $913. And that's actually not correct you do have to pay the full $913 per week, whether the employee works 20 hours a week, 30 hours a week, or 40 hours a week. So if you want to classify them as salaried exempt, it would require that full $913. Another question that we frequently get has to do with non-exempt employees who are paid on a salary basis. So, for example, sometimes an employer chooses to pay 
an employee who is non-exempt, in other words, they're, um, they're eligible for overtime on a salary basis for a set a number of hours per week, and let's say it's 45. So as you can see, that employee is actually working five hours of overtime per week. So the salary will pay for all of the straight time hours of that employee, but it will not be paid paying for the overtime for that five hours. So you would be required to still pay an overtime premium on the hours worked beyond 40 for that employee. Let me see, another question. Looking through my notes to see if I have any other commonly asked questions. I actually have a question. So go I'll, ahead. I'll go ahead and give you a question. All right. So we have a, um, a member who their employees all do AutoCAD work. One of those employees who does the AutoCAD work also supervises two people, but they're paid on an hourly basis because it's kind of a part-time supervisory right. position. But they currently do get paid overtime. So is this act going to really affect them at all? I guess I'm not sure. Oh, that's a good question. So as long as they're paying both their CAD drafting employees, which we had indicated earlier wouldn't meet the professional exemption, mm -hmm. as long as they're paying them hourly and they're paying the supervisor hourly, they actually would have no argument from the Department of Labor. The reason I like that question is that as far as the Department of Labor is concerned, every employee is non-exempt and subject to those requirements. So really, the employer must, is held accountable for proving that an employee is actually exempt. I've actually known a couple of organizations who they do pay all of their employees on an hourly basis and they would have no concerns in terms of um, actually complying with the Fair Labor Standards Act. Controlling costs might be a different question. <laughs> right. Correct. So one of the other things that we do get asked about is, you know, how you go about converting pay when moving someone from a salaried position, say you've been paying them as a salaried employee but now a salaried exempt, and now they're going to become an hourly non-exempt employee. So there is not a prescribed formula, so you can look at it many different ways you might say that their salary actually was meant to cover 40 hours per week, or you might say that when you set their salary, it was anticipated that would, it would cover 50 or 60 hours per week. For example, um, I find that field sales reps are, you know, are one, not, not who sell, but who actually go out and do repair on equipment that that is generally a non-exempt position. It's one of the more frequently misclassified positions. And they sometimes work very long hours in a week. And those particular positions, you may say, hey, we actually paid your salary based on the expectation that it would be 55 hours, in which case, when you set their hourly rate, it's not going to be taking that salary and dividing it by 40 but by actually dividing it by 55. When you do that, though, you'll still need to take an eye to what are competitive pay rates for that position. If you're trying to pay your position $16 an hour and the competition is all paying $19 and $20 an hour, you'll have some challenges. So I don't see any other questions. Um, do you want to check up here under questions? Yeah, let's double check there. Oh, here we go. All right. Can I click on this one? Okay. Um, how do I scroll up to get those? Okay, we do have a couple of questions. So yeah, there we go. Can we expand that at all? Um. Okay. Is there any way we can receive a copy of the PowerPoint? Would you like to speak to that, Liz? Yes. Everyone who 
registered for the webinar will receive a link. We are recording it and the PowerPoint is in um, the recording, so you will all receive that tomorrow as a follow-up. Okay. Back to the signs page. Um, sure. <laughs> let me and um, let me go ahead and do that while we're answering questions. Then I think I can do that. Well, let me I probably have to click go back over here, right? Mm -hmm. Oops, wrong way. Okay. I can click back over here. Let me see another question. Does this pertain to manual labor as well? Um, I'm not quite sure the context, but generally speaking, um, positions that involve manual labor are going to be non-exempt. It's only white collar positions that are generally performed in an office that typically actually qualify for the exemption test. Okay, can you please clarify what the standard states regarding an employee that receives sales commissions? Okay, if an employee is going out and regularly calling upon customers, then they would have an opportunity to meet the sales exemption. The regularly calling upon customers from a federal basis is, you know, could be 50% of the job. When we look at that, under Wisconsin, however, Wisconsin regulations indicate that they should be calling on customers 80% of the time. So you may find that the outside sales exemption does not apply. Now there can be positions that receive commissions that maybe are not outside sales. I've seen this in customer service positions. I've seen it with some marketing positions. In those cases, you, all, you could look to see whether or not the administrative exemption would apply. That's the most likely one that I find. You know, again, remember the flow as we went down, we went through executive and then professional and then computer and sales and finally administrative because the administrative is the most difficult. So always check to see if they might go along with one of the others. But just the payment of commissions does not make a position exempt. And there's a request for this link. I think what I can do is I can find that for you, Liz, and you could, if you would like, put that up with the um, webinar. I'll include it with the webinar, yep. Yeah. Okay. All right, I have a question on a project manager that is under the new minimum salary because he's new, he's working more than anticipated because he is still new. If he is moved to the new minimum, everything would be in compliance. Right, as long as the position itself meets the duties test, we always assume that's you know, the case, as long as you move that employee up to the new salary minimum by December 1st, then they're going to meet the salary test as well as the duties test. Remember, each of those stands on their own, so they have to meet the salary. They have to be paid as a salaried employee. It has to be at that minimum threshold, and they have to meet the duties test. I think that's all of our okay. questions. Well, why don't we go to your final um, PowerPoint slide, so if people do have further questions, um, we have contact information for you uh, to MRA as well, so you may want to also reach out to them, but you'll have a link to the PowerPoint, Oops. and we'll also send you the link to the Department of Labor. Um, but of course, reach out to the BBB as well if, if you need. We'll yeah, I'm not sure why it, it is. I, I was afraid to click to there end we go. it. <laughs> So feel free to uh, contact the Better Business Bureau as well, and we can put you in contact with MRA also. And if we need to, specific questions, we'll get them over to Mary from the BBB. So either one works. 
But Mary, I just want to thank you so much for going through this information. It was great. And I want to thank everyone who attended and look for your email tomorrow with a copy of this recording and the PowerPoint. Right, and we'll also include that link um, for some of the tips that the Department has, of Labor has provided for nonprofits and how you can comply. So Perfect. thanks for your time and attention. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon.